Boy, have I had a day. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's never been a day like this day. And I can say that categorically. There's never been a day like this day. In order for you to get a full feel for it, I've got to take you all the way back to the beginning. I started real early, long before the sun came up. I skipped breakfast. I've actually been skipping a lot of things lately. I've been skipping breakfast almost every day. I've been skipping dinner with the family. I've been skipping date night with my wife. I've been skipping all the kids' games. And yeah, I've been skipping church. But, but you know, the reason I'm skipping all this stuff is because I got this big project due at work. My boss has told me that if I can just land this one account, well, there's a partnership in it for me. And if I do the partnership, well, then I'll be able to provide for my family. And, and I really want to provide for my family. And I'm working real hard. And, and so that's why I'm skipping everything. So I skip breakfast and I hop in the car and I drive to work and I park in my parking lot of my office building. The sun isn't even up yet. And I walk through the front doors and there's uh, Joe, um, I don't even know his last name. I think uh, I just call him Joe the security guard. We'll go with that. There's Joe the security guard. Good morning, Mr. Matthewson. That's my name, by the way, Daniel Scott Matthewson. Good morning, Mr. Matthewson. Hey, good morning, Joe. The Lord been good to you today, Mr. Matthewson. Oh, yeah, the Lord's been fine to me today. I'm pushing 428, hoping this thing goes fast. As the doors open, he starts quoting scripture. Remember, Mr. Matthewson, that therefore there is no temptation that has seized you except that which is common to man. Oh, it's way too cheery for me this early in the morning. I get up to my office on the 28th floor. It's a corner office. It's pretty sweet. And in the office is Juanita Perez, my cleaning lady. I walked in. I said, Juanita, I've asked you time and time again, please be done in my office before I arrive. She said, oh, Mr. Matthewson, I'm trying. I really am, but... Uh, I keep coming in earlier, but then you keep coming in earlier and earlier. I can't get here before you anymore. I'm sorry. I'll keep trying. Now, I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to tell her just to leave. I don't want to be mean. So I do the next best thing. I sit, I sit down at my desk, and I just start working, ignoring her. I don't even look at her. Just ignore her. I'm working away, and she's dusting away, trying to be quiet. And she comes over to my desk, and she takes the picture off my desk, and she sees my wife and my kids, and she said, Oh, Mr. Matthewson. Your children, they're so beautiful. Uh, th thank you, Juanita, thank you. And your wife, she was so nice to me last year at the company picnic. Oh, that's, that's great, Juanita, whatever. She gets the hint, puts the picture back on my desk and walks to the door, and she pauses at the door, and she looks back at me, and she says, Mr. Matthewson, you're a good man. You've got a good family. I want you to know I pray for you all the time. Off she goes. <laughs> now I feel guilty, right? I mean, here I didn't even want to talk to her, and I find out she's praying, but there's no time to feel guilty because I've got this project due at two, and I've got the rest of the morning to put it together. So I have one person that had different parts of the project assigned to them in my office after another, after another, after another, after another. By noon, it's all done. It's sitting on my desk, the front cover, four-color, glossy. Mwah! Looks great. I realize I've got time to go grab a bite to eat. And so I hop in my car, and I start driving down the road towards this great Jewish deli that's just right near my office. As I'm just driving down the road, minding my own business, that's when it happened. Just like that. Jesus came back. I mean, I always learned in Bible class that one day Jesus was going to return, but the way they said it, one day, it sounded like it would be perpetually in the future. I didn't realize it would be one day like this day, but it was this day. And in an instant, I found myself walking into the halls of heaven. How do I describe it? Um, have you ever seen one of those ticker tape parades in New York, you know, with all the confetti and people jumping up and down? That's what it looked like. Except multiply it thousands of times. The joy and the celebration was unbelievable. I saw people I hadn't seen in years. I saw people who had died decades earlier that I had forgotten to miss. And we reacquainted ourselves with each other, and we talked, and we laughed, and we talked about old times. And, oh, it was absolutely exhausting. I saw a rock. I kind of excused myself from everyone else and thought, I'm going to go sit down over here and rest for a little bit. And I was tired. It's been a big day. <laughs> I sat down, and even though I was alone, at least I thought I was, I sensed like there was someone with me. But I couldn't find anyone, but I... I had this nagging sensation that someone was watching me, and finally I just said, hey, is there anybody out there? Is there someone there? And, whew. oh, yeah, there was. Hello. Who or what are you? He said, my name's Uriel. I'm a heavenly messenger. You're an angel. Yes. <laughs> 
Well, nice to meet you, Uriel. I've never met an angel before. Well, I've known you for a long time, Daniel. You know my name, of course. How do you know my name? I was assigned to you at the moment of conception to make sure you were all right. You're my guardian angel? Well, we don't use that terminology up here, Daniel. <laughs> but you can call me that if you want. I ran over and I gave him a hug. <laughs> How do I describe him? He was, he was about nine feet tall and he just looked like a hollow person made out of light. He said, I'm here uh, to take care of you and to show you heaven. I said, you are? He said, yeah. Well, teach me heaven. Teach me everything I can learn about heaven, please. And so he started to teach me about transportation in heaven. He said, Daniel, I can pick you up by your arms and I can fly around. And he did it. <gasps> Oh, and when I got over my terror, I started to enjoy it. And he set me down. He said, your eyes are different in heaven, too. I said, how? He said, see that thing over there? It's about five miles away. Look at it and zoom in on it. And I looked at it and zoomed in on it, and I could see it as though it was right in front of my face. I had telephoto eyes, zoom lenses. <laughs> <laughs> they worked. He said, communication is different in heaven, too. I said, how? He said, you don't have to verbally communicate. You don't know. You can just think things to each other. I, I said, let's try it. And so I had a conversation with Uriel, just with our minds. <laughs> and it worked. And they said, and let me teach you about the coming judgment. I said, the what? The coming judgment. I said, no, there's no coming judgment. Yeah, there is. No, 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 I learned. I learned about the great white throne judgment, that Jesus would stand on his throne and he would separate the sheep from the goats, those who really knew him and those who didn't. And those who didn't, they would go to hell forever. And those who did, they got ushered into heaven. And anyone whose name was written in the Lamb's book of life was one of those sheeps, and they were ushered into heaven. And my name's written there, so I, I get to escape that judgment. There's no judgment for me. And he said, didn't anyone ever tell you about the Bema? Uh, no. What's the Bema? The judgment seat of Christ that every Christian will stand toward. I had a shriek of terror go from my toenails to my hair follicles. I was absolutely terrified. But it was a strange terror. It was kind of a terror combined with a comfort. Kind of like when I went to the doctor as a kid. I had a sore tummy right here, and he poked and prodded, and that made it even worse. And he said, I've got to take out your appendix. And I was terrified to get my appendix taken out, but I knew I'd be better off when it was done, so I said, let's do it. That's how I looked at this Bema judgment of Christ. I was terrified, but I knew, I had sensed in my soul that it would be better for me afterwards, and so I said, let's do it, as if I had a choice. I said, Uriel, teach me about this Bema seat judgment of Christ. He said, okay. It's not punitive. What do you mean? Your sins will not be on trial. They won't know. You're not a criminal on trial. That's all been taken care of. The blood of Christ has covered your sins. You don't have to worry about your sins at the Bema seat judgment of Christ. Oh, I was so relieved. Well, if it's not about that, what is it about? He said, have you ever seen the Olympics on TV? Yeah. And someone wins a race? Yeah. And they get up on the podium? Right. And then the official comes by and they bow their head? Yeah. And the official puts the medal on their head? Yeah. That's what the Bama seat is all about. What do you mean? Well, the Christian life was a race and you've run it and you've come to the finish line. And the Bema seat of Christ is when you will stand before Jesus and he will reward you for what you did of eternal significance in his power while you were still on earth. He will? Yeah. I was racking my brain trying to think of anything I had done of eternal significance. And I was praying that Jesus' memory was better than mine. As we continued to talk about the Bema seat judgment, off in the distance, way in the distance, I heard a fanfare. Uriel, what's that? He said, that's the call to the Bema judgment seat of Christ. Come on, and he picked me up and started to fly me. And I wasn't the only one that was flying. There were people all around me flying, and there were people underneath me flying, and they were all flying towards this little circle off in the distance, which as we got closer and closer, I realized it wasn't a little circle at all. And there were people coming from all the four corners of heaven. They were all around me. And as we flew over this thing, it was massive. And it was, it was a stadium is what it was, but it was the stadium the size of a, a metropolitan area. I mean, it was miles and miles across. And there were people all around us. And he dropped me right in front of the gate. And he said, I've got to leave now. I said, what do you mean you've got to leave now? Where are you going? You've got to come in there with me. He said, no, this is just for the bride of Christ. Just for humans saved by grace. 
But don't worry, we angels will be up above watching the proceedings, and you can always think to me if you have a question. <laughs> Off he flew. And there I stood alone, surrounded by millions of people. Well, I better go in. Over the arch it said, the Bema Seat of Christ. I walked in under the arch. Oh my goodness, look at this place. It was absolutely massive. There were people as far as the eye could see. I could see the platform down there about three miles. <laughs> but with my telephoto eyes, I zoomed in on the face of someone who was working on the throne of Christ. I could see him as though he was right in front of my face. And I zoomed back out and I realized the place was filling up. I better find a seat. I saw one over there and so I started to make one. Well, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. It was just like church. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. And I found my seat. And as we were sitting there, I realized that there was someone sitting next to me. And so I looked at him and I smiled and he said, hello. I said, hello. He said, my name is Indira Jenske. It is. He said, what is your name? When and where are you from? I'd never heard that question before. When and where are you from? And people asked me where I was from, but why would he ask me when? And that's when it struck me that everybody sitting in this huge stadium was from the entire history of the Christian church. 2,000 plus years of people. So you couldn't just say, where were you from? You had to say, where and when were you from? So I said, well, I'm Daniel Matthewson, and I was in the United States of America at the time that Jesus returned. Oh, what a joy that must have been, he said. And, and when and where are you from? And he said, I'm from Japan in the 17th century. 17th century? I said, I, I didn't know there were any Christians in Japan in the 17th century. Oh, yes, the big wooden ships that brought trade and commerce from the West also brought missionaries. And one of those missionaries came to my little village, and he shared the good news that Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, had come to earth and had shed his blood on the cross. And anybody who came to the cross and asked for forgiveness of their sins would have their sins washed by his blood and could live forever with the Father. And it struck a chord with me, and I trusted Christ, and He changed me. And many of my family and my friends were changed by the blood of Christ. Even some of the samurai, some of the ruthless lords in our area were changed. But my samurai was not changed. He was a brutal man, and he persecuted the church, and he even put some of us to death. Some of us? I said, yeah, some of us. You were put to death? Yeah. I was crucified on the side of a road. And next to me was one of the great samurais of our region who had been a brutal man who had been completely transformed by the blood of Christ. And as he hung there, he looked to heaven and he saw it as a great honor to suffer for his Lord. <laughs> as he was telling me these things, my head just dropped. I kept it bowed. He said, what are you thinking, Daniel? I said, oh, I never suffered like that. I never suffered like that. In fact, I never suffered at all. I, feel bad that I didn't suffer. He said, oh, don't, don't worry about it. God chooses who will suffer, and those that suffer, he allows to have a tremendous amount of grace so that they can stand up under it. If he saw fit that you not suffer, consider that a great blessing. We continued to talk. As I looked around, I realized that the entire stadium had filled up. There wasn't one extra seat. Everybody had a place to sit. The entire Bride of Christ had arrived. <laughs> As we continued to talk, a huge angel walked to the front of the platform. He was magnificent. I don't know who he was. He never introduced himself, but this is what I always imagined Gabriel and Michael to look like. He was about 18 feet tall. He was radiant. He had big, huge, golden flowing robes. He had a face that was just bronze, and his eyes were huge and deep. His smile was warm and inviting, and he had a 15-foot high staff in his hands. And he went to the front of the stage, and he pounded it on the platform five times. By the time the third pound had reverberated through the stadium, it was completely quiet. Dead silence. You could have heard a pin drop. And the angel said, Welcome to the Bride of Christ. Your groom awaits you. 
Let me introduce you to your groom, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Son of God and Son of Man, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty One, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus showed up. And he walked very quickly to the front of the stage. And he said, oh, my bride. Oh, my bride, I have so long awaited this day. The great marriage feast of the Lamb is being prepared as I speak. But first, the judgment. Oh, what fun we're going to have. What a great day of rejoicing this will be. My Father, God the Father, Yahweh, I am, will preside over our proceedings. He's entering the stadium now, and he turned and looked to the back of the stadium. Oh, how do I describe what I saw? Now, now I know why the book of Revelation was so hard to understand, why John struggled so much to put into human language what you see in the heavenlies. I don't know how I describe this. Let me give it a shot. Over the back of the stadium appeared a cube, if you will. This cube had on each corner of it some winged creatures. They looked like they were kind of half angels, half animals. And they were chanting, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Inside the cube were moving parts, and inside the moving parts were more moving parts. And there were colors that I'd never seen before. They were outside the human spectrum. And it all confused my senses. And as they ushered the presence of God into the stadium, I realized a misunderstanding I'd always have. I'd always assumed that God the Father kind of looked like Santa Claus with a big white beard and a cane like this, you know. He'd sit on his throne and he'd pat us on the head. But then I remembered from my Bible teachings that God the Father was an omnipresent spirit. And that what I was seeing here was just a partial manifestation of his incredible glory, his praise and his honor. The angels, the cherubim, and the seraphim on each corner of the cube continued to chant, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we started to join in. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Jesus invited us to sing praises to the Father. And so we started to worship through song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. We sang and we praised and we jumped and we clapped until we were exhausted. <laughs> we eventually found our ways back to our seats. As I sat down, I found myself thinking, boy, you know, I never, I never praised Jesus like that when I was back on earth. You know, in our church services, I'd kind of stand there, kind of looking around at the ceiling or singing half-heartedly. And I thought, you know, if I could do it again, if I could go back, I would sing differently if I had another chance. As we're all still catching our breath, Jesus got up from his throne and walked to the front of the platform. And he said, okay, my bride, it's time for the judgment. But before we start, I want you to understand what this judgment is all about. You are not a criminal on trial. Your sins will not appear in my mind at the judgment seat of Christ. My blood has covered them. Relax. And we all did. Relax. He said, this judgment is a time for me to reward you for the difference you made in my kingdom, in my power. You will be evaluated on three criteria. The first is on your priorities in life. I told you when I was preaching on the Sermon on the Mountain, I told you that you should not store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Instead, I said, store up treasure here in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. Some of you did that. Today you will see how much treasure you sent because at the judgment seat you will receive the treasure that you sent up before you. You will also be evaluated on stewardship, what you did with what I gave you. You won't be compared one to another because there are no two people of us in the entire massive gathering that had identical opportunities, resources, skills, talents, abilities, and those types of things. As a result, you will each be evaluated over and against what you were given, 
What did you do with what I gave you? Some of you were from very poor nations and very poor times of history. Others from very wealthy nations and very wealthy times of history. I will look at what you had and what you did with it. You'll also be evaluated on your motives. I told you in Scripture that mankind looks at outward appearance, but I look at the heart. Today I will reveal to you what I saw there. You will receive rewards here at the Bema Seat of Christ. That's why it's going to be so exciting. You will receive the treasure that you sent up, and you'll get to take that with you. But there will also be some crowns. The crown of righteousness will be given. The crown of righteousness is given to anybody who lived for this day and patterned their life in preparation for this day. The crown of life will be given to anyone who was persecuted for my name's sake. The crown of glory for anybody who shepherded my people. Now, I'm not talking about you professional pastors. You folks will be evaluated much more stringently, and don't tell me I didn't warn you. It's right there in the epistles. But those of you who are lay people, now we don't use that terminology up here in heaven, but you know what I mean. Those of you that were lay people and poured your life into the church, into my people, into the bride of Christ, you will receive the crown of glory today. <laughs> Some of you will receive the crown of faith. That's for those of you who trusted me through the thick and thin all the way to the end, persevering and trusting me all the way to the end. Some of you will receive verbal commendation. I will look you in the eye and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. All of you will be glorified today. Glorification, that wonderful culmination of the process of salvation that started that first day that the Holy Spirit started drawing you into a relationship with me. Continued on that day that you humbled yourself before me and my blood washed you clean all the way through the years as I was sanctifying you, as I was making you look more like me. It will be finalized today as you are glorified. The great exclamation point of the process of salvation. You will receive your heavenly body at the same time. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Let's get started. Prepare your hearts for the judgment. Jesus returned to his throne. <laughs> and if you thought you could cut the tension with the knife when we sat down the first time, whew. I mean, there, there had to be two or three billion people in the stadium. Every one of us were completely convinced our name was going to be the first one called. <laughs> the big angel walked to the front of the platform once again, and he announced the first person by thumping three times with his staff on the stage. Timulus Germanicus. Timulus stood up and his angel swooped down and grabbed him under the arms and flew him all the way down to the bottom of the steps leading up to the platform where the throne of Christ rested. Timulus bounded up the platform and looked his savior face to face. They started to have a conversation. Now we couldn't hear the conversation. It was a private conversation. But the strangest thing happened. While they were talking, we could see the life of Timulus lived out in front of our eyes. We could see the things that he was going to be rewarded for, everyone in the whole stadium. We learned that he was born in the third century in Lyon, France, under Roman Empire rule. He was a poor man, a smith by trade. He was a deacon in his church. He gave of his meager means to those less fortunate than him, even though he hardly had anything. He was persecuted and tortured for his faith. He was scraped, which means the skin was removed from his body. He was put on the rack, bent backwards, his bones dislocated. He was eventually thrown to the wild beasts, and as he was being devoured by lions and leopards, on his knees he looked up to the sky and he said, My name is Timulus, and I belong to Jesus. He fell on his face before his king. Jesus, full of compassion and joy, got up off his throne, picked him up by the hands, raised him to his feet went around behind him and put his hands on his shoulders. He said, this is my boy, Timulus. I am so pleased with him. He gave him the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of life, and the crown of faith. He got all four of them. His treasures were just piled up around him. <laughs> and Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And in an instant, he was changed, and he and all his treasures flew back to his seat. And as he got back to the seat, he looked like the North Star in a blackened sky. 
<laughs> we were all amazed. And the angel introduced the next person to be judged. Pomponia Gracina. Pomponia was from Rome in the first century. She was a believer even before Paul arrived in Rome. She was the first of the senatorial class to trust Christ. She was ostracized and ridiculed for her faith. Even her husband made fun of her, but by her unconditional love and continued witness, he eventually trusted Christ and grew. And they, as a couple, planted a church in their home that survived till the third century. <laughs> Jesus said, oh, I am so proud of you. He gave her the crown of glory for taking care of his flock. And he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And she was glorified. And as she returned to her seat, the angel thumped again. William Carey. If there's ever been an unlikely hero in Christendom, it was William Carey, an impoverished shoemaker from England who had a passion for world evangelization that was not shared by the church in England at the time. Didn't let that stop him. He decided to go to Malta by himself, even though he had no support or encouragement. He then went to India, and he became known as the father of modern-day missions to those who were around when Christ returned. Jesus did an interesting thing with William. He stood up next to him and he turned him around to the whole crowd and he said, if you are here at the Bema because of the influence of this man, either direct or indirect over the centuries of the great mission movement, please stand now. And all around the stadium, probably a billion people stood up and they had all different colored faces and they spoke different languages. <laughs> and he was overwhelmed and Jesus picked him up off his knees and said, oh, William, well done my good and faithful servant. And he was glorified. <laughs> and the angel introduced the next. Angela Moser. As soon as Angela's name was announced, there was a fluttering of wings in the heavenlies. Oh, that's interesting. What's going on up there? So I thought to Uriel, Uriel, what's going on up there? And he said, oh, we're so excited. It's Angela's turn. I said, well, why? What's so big about her? Is she a big person? Oh, in heaven, she's a big person. Why do you say that? What did she make? What did she build? What did she give? What did she lead? Oh, none of that stuff. She's a behind-the-scenes hero in heaven. I saw her life played before my eyes. She remained single by choice to care for her invalid sister and her aging mother. She worked in behind-the-scenes serving ministries in the church, caring for people there. But the reason that Angela Moser was famous in heaven was because of her prayer life. Oh, this woman prayed. She prayed for missions. She prayed for the lost in her area of influence. She prayed for her pastor. She prayed for her church. She prayed for the ill. She prayed without ceasing. And they made such a big deal about it at the Bema Seat of Christ. Jesus actually leapt off his throne and he ran down towards her and he threw his arms around her and he said, Oh, Angela, I am so proud of you. Way to go. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And she was glorified. And when she was, we all noticed that she was glorified more magnificently than anyone, even William Carey, that had gone before her. And as she made it back to her seat, she lit up that whole portion of the stadium. And I thought, Wow! Prayer really must be important. I should have listened to Pete. <laughs> he told me, he preached on it, and I didn't listen. I thought, you know, if I could go back and do it again, if I could go back and do it again, I'd pray more. Because at the Bema Seat of Christ, prayer makes all the difference in heaven. The angel introduced the next person to be judged. Joseph Ray Robinson. Joseph was born in the South during the Depression. Not a good place to be for an African-American gentleman. He was not allowed to go to school, and so he had to work bit jobs to pay the food bills for his eight children. He drove limousines, he delivered papers, he shined shoes, he worked as a security guard in a high-rise office complex. <gasps> It's Joe, Joe the security guard from my building. I didn't recognize him at first. I saw his life play before my eyes and I was humbled. He didn't get embittered by the refusal of the school district to let him go to school. Instead, he taught himself to read by reading the New Testament. He memorized three quarters of the New Testament. 
He knew that the Bible, the Word of God, was a double-edged sword, so anyone that he came in contact with, he would share a Bible verse with. <laughs> I wasn't the only one. Jesus asked the people who had been influenced by Joe to stand up, and I saw probably about 100 people from my office complex that were at the Bema because of his witness, and I thought, oh, <laughs> this guy who annoyed me this morning, tonight I wonder if I'm even worthy to shine his shoes in heaven. And Jesus said, well done! My good and faithful servant, Joe, be glorified. He was glorified and he flew back to his seat, radiant and full of joy, and the angel announced yet another. Juanita Perez. My cleaning lady. <laughs> I learned a lot about Juanita as I saw her life lived out before my eyes. Her husband deserted her. With three small children, she raised them on her own, working a day job and a night job. They loved Jesus because of her prayer. She was a woman of prayer, too. And the Lord allowed me to see how much she had prayed for my kids, and I was stunned. He allowed me to see the impact her prayer had on my children, and it came to me that she had had a greater impact on my kids than I had, and I was humbled. And I thought, this woman that I wouldn't even look in the eye this morning is someone I want to spend a thousand years with tonight. And Jesus said, oh, Juanita, well done, my good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And she was, and she went back to her seat, leaping and jumping and praising God and singing his praise, and everyone around her was thrilled. And I looked around the stadium, and about three-quarters of it was all lit up. I thought, man, my turn's got to be coming soon. And sure enough, after a few hundred thousand more, <laughs> <laughs> the angel came to the front of the stage. Daniel Scott Matthewson. Oh, boy. Here you'll grab me by the arms and flew me down to the bottom of the stairs. Oh, boy. <laughs> As I started to walk up the stairs, I thought for an instant about the fact that the entire history of the Christian church was looking at the back of my head. But that was irrelevant because in front of me sat on the throne Jesus himself. I got to the top step and just stopped right there, teetering on the edge. <laughs> he said, Daniel, come closer. We had a conversation. It was the conversation I'd seen other people have with Jesus millions of times, but now I knew the content of that conversation. Jesus said, Daniel, I want you to understand the judgment fully before we start. You need to know the purpose of the judgment. It's not to deal with your sins. Your sins have been dealt with. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do. My blood has covered your sins. This judgment has nothing to do with your sin. This judgment is all about your stewardship. What you did with the things that I entrusted to you for my purposes. Daniel, you were given 37 years of time. 25 after your conversion. We'll evaluate what you did with that time. You were given financial resources. You were given spiritual gifts, too, actually. You were given the gift of teaching and the gift of encouragement. We'll evaluate what you did for my church with those gifts. You were given talents and treasures. You were given a family and a background and a heritage. We'll take all those things, we'll put them all together, and we'll see what you did with all that for me. Do you understand? I said, yeah. Yeah, I understand. He said, Daniel, sometimes people ask me questions when they get to this point. One of the questions I hear all the time is, why are we doing the judgment today? I mean, why didn't you give us uh, rewards back when we were on earth? And my response to that is, I did! You were so busy, you didn't notice. Either that or you attributed the rewards to your own efforts and missed them altogether. But the reason that we do the majority of the rewards today is because before this day, it's impossible to know the full impact of your activity. You see, when you impact someone's life, when they go and they impact other people's lives, and then those people go and impact other people's lives, and it's like a web going out, and you will get credit all the way down the line here at the Bema Seat of Christ. Wow. As he was telling me this, I couldn't help but think of D.L. Moody, a man who'd lived 
a couple hundred years before me, his judgment had been just before mine. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist, led lots of people to Christ, and he got credit for those things. But he started a little Bible study that grew into a, a school, and that school grew into a big school called Moody Bible Institute. And I watched with amazement as I saw in his judgment, he received partial credit for everybody who was trained at Moody Bible Institute here at the Bema. And then those people, when they went out and impacted people, like my youth pastor from my church back in Dallas and his wife, they were Moody trained. And they came and they influenced kids in our church. And then those kids influenced others. And Moody got credit for all these people hundreds of years after he died. Jesus said, today I can tell you the full impact of your work in my name, Daniel. And I said, I'm looking forward to seeing what it looked like, Jesus. He said, let me explain the process. That's when he took me to a Bible passage, actually. One found in 1 Corinthians 3 in our Bibles back on earth. He said, Daniel, your life is like a house. It was built on the foundation of me the day that you trusted me for salvation when you were 12 years old. I was the foundation of your house, but then in my power you were told to build a house of eternal significance. Now, in the same way that you can build a building with um, cheap material or valuable material, with wood and hay and stubble, worthless stuff, or with precious stones and jewels, worthwhile stuff, you can build your life same way. You can build it with worthless temporal stuff or eternal, valuable, worthwhile things. I want you to imagine, Daniel, that I'm taking a big flamethrower and I'm going to put it over your life, over your house. And those things made out of temporal things, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, the worthless things, they will be incinerated before your eyes and we'll never deal with them again. They'll be gone. They mean nothing here. But those worthwhile things, those precious stones, they will be purified in the fire. And you will receive those as treasures for the rest of eternity. Jesus started to teach me about worthlessness on earth. You see, I was uh, assumed that that meant sin and the nasty things we did to people, and I was excited about that getting burned up. <laughs> but what I didn't realize is that also included things that people on earth considered good, but things that were done with impure motives, wrong motives. And I looked at Jesus and I said, I got to object, Jesus. I mean, when did I ever do anything with 100% pure motives? He said, never. You're incapable. You're human. But what I was looking for, Daniel, was the dominant motive. I mean, what was driving you? Even though there's other impure motives there, what was driving you? And what will happen is when we have a dominant motive that is pure, the other impure motives will be burned away by my fire and it will be purified and all that you'll have left is pure. He said, sometimes you put an offering in the plate just because you wanted people around you to notice you're doing it. That will be burned away. That's irrelevant in heaven. Other times in secret and quietly you gave because in your spirit you sensed the need to do so and you will receive rewards for that here. Do you understand? I said, I think I get it. He said, all right, Daniel, are you ready to start? No. I'm really not. <laughs> he said, well, Daniel, I'm afraid there's a bunch of people lined up behind you and we've got to keep moving, so we're going to start. Okay, <laughs> okay. Guess I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Let's go. And so the judgment began. Have you heard the phrase, my life flashed before my eyes? Well, my life flashed before my eyes, literally flash before my eyes. When other people were up there, it seemed like their judgment lasted about a minute and a half. But my judgment lasted 37 years. My entire life I lived over, except this time I lived it with Jesus' perspective instead of mine. Jesus walked me through my entire life, fire coming from his eyes, burning the worthless things, refining the worthwhile things. And we started way back at the beginning saw my parents bringing me home from the hospital, and the joy that they found in their little one-bedroom apartment in this little bundle of joy. And then my toddler years and my preschool years and my elementary years, and as the years went by, I noticed the eyes of Christ incinerating it all. All of it was wood, hay, and stubble, completely worthless as far as eternity was concerned. I wasn't a Christian yet. I couldn't do anything of eternal significance. One of the major motifs of those years was sin. I mean, as I watched myself, I was stunned by how selfish I was, my horrific self-centeredness. It was me, 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 all about me, all the time. And as I was cowering away from my sin, as it was being burned in front of my eyes, I glanced up at Jesus and I noticed something amazing. His demeanor hadn't changed at all. His eyes were still full of compassion and his smile, radiant. And I realized he can't see the sin. 
His blood has covered it. <laughs> he can't see it. Yes. And not only that, as my sin and stuff, worthless stuff was all burned away, I was incapable of remembering it myself. So I realized at the end of my judgment, not only would Jesus not be able to see my sin, I wouldn't be able to remember it either. Yes. This was great. The highlight of my first 12 years of my life came one evening. When I was a 12-year-old boy, I went up to my bedroom. I was pondering life on my bed. And I came to grips with the fact that I couldn't save myself. And I got on my knees next to my bed. And I prayed a very simple prayer. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm lost. I can't save myself. I've tried to be good. I can't be good enough for you. Save me, I pray. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me, I pray. Come and live inside me and change me. Enable me to live for you and for your purposes. I prayed this simple prayer as a 12-year-old boy. And here from the Bama seat, I could see my soul turning from black to white. I could see my soul going from death to life. I could see the Holy Spirit coming and living inside me. And I was amazed at the incredible transformation that took place in that moment. And I looked back at Jesus, and his eyes were full of tears. And he said, oh. I love you so much. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for saying yes to me. I said, oh, no, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. And we thanked each other back and forth and had a precious moment. Jesus said, all right, Daniel. Now we can get down to business. Now you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You are now capable of doing something of eternal significance. You've got 25 years left in your life. Everything up until this point has been burned away, but now there's a chance of doing some eternal good. Let's see what we see. And we headed off into my post-conversion years. Now, I don't have 25 years with you this morning. <laughs> so what I've got to do is I've got to summarize a little bit for you. And here's how I'm going to summarize. I'm going to share with you three things that I noticed over those 25 years, three observations, three lessons that were very powerfully brought home to me as Jesus walked through my life. The first one is that Jesus and what Jesus thinks needs to be paramount. What Jesus thinks about me needs to be more important than what anyone else thinks about me. Now, that's very easy to say here at the Bama seat, but that's not the way I lived on earth. See, I had this problem. I wanted people to like me. <laughs> I was a pleaser. I wanted to fit in with the in crowd, no matter who that happened to be, no matter how old I was. As a result, I made some poor choices and poor decisions to get the in crowd to like me, never once inquiring what Jesus thought. One example happened shortly after I was saved. As a 12-year-old, I was playing on the jungle gym with my buddy Jimmy, and we were swinging around, and we were having a great time. And all of a sudden, some of the kids from the in-group came over, and uh, they were older than us, and they, they said, hey, you want to play baseball? And I went to Jimmy, yeah, we'd love to play baseball. And they said, well, we don't want Jimmy. We've just got room for one. We want you, Daniel. Do you want to play? I looked at Jimmy, and he said, it's okay. Go ahead and play. I'll be fine. Really? You sure? You don't mind? Okay, thanks. And off I went, running off with my new friends. Never looked back at Jimmy, but here from the Bama seat, I could see his heart crumbling. And I looked at Jesus, and Jesus wasn't watching me running off with my friends. He was focused on the broken heart. And I realized I, I never asked Jesus what he thought. Didn't even think of it. I just ran off with the guys who I thought were more important. This pattern continued into my adolescent years. I had all the wars with my dad. Son, why don't you go get your hair cut? Dad, I cut my hair last year. I'll cut it again next. Get off my back, all right? You're not going out dressed like that, are you? Yeah, I am. No, you're not. And we're butting heads. And you know what? Most of the things we fought about, I didn't even care about. It was just my friends who wanted me to look like this and to sound like this and to act like this. And I was trying to impress them. And so I got into fights with my dad all the way through my adolescent years. And I looked at Jesus and I said, Jesus, why did I struggle with this so much? Why was I so focused on what everyone else thought about me? Is what he said. He said, Daniel, I am the bread of life. If you would have feasted on me, 
you would have never gone hungry. Only I satisfy. You were so busy. You never got time with me. As a result, you didn't sense my full approval and you went looking for approval from others. And you made some very poor decisions along the way. The propensity continued all the way into my college years. I went to school with my buddy Jerry from high school, and we were best friends, man, Jerry, baby. <laughs> and we had decided, we decided that we were going to do all four years, man. We're going to room together all four years. Nothing's ever going to come between us, and we were all set. We were about to get our apartment, and a guy came over to me and said, hey, Daniel, I want you to come into our fraternity with us. You do? Yeah. Well, how about Jerry here? Well, we don't want Jerry. Well, you don't understand. We're going to room together. Oh, I'm sorry. We just want you. And I looked at Jerry and said, well, what do you think? He said, go ahead. Really? Are you sure? You don't mind? Okay, thanks, buddy. And off I went once again with my new friends, never looking back at Jerry. And just like Jimmy, I saw his heart break at the throne of Christ. And I told myself, you know, if I could do it again, if I could just go back, I would live my life so differently when I was trying to make choices. I would ask Jesus, what do you think? I wouldn't be driven by other people's opinion of me. That was my first observation. My second lesson was this, that investing in people is really worthwhile. Investing in people is really worthwhile. Now, I don't know how you look at people, but I always looked at people kind of like they were scenery in my life. <laughs> you know? I mean, they're there to make my life more colorful. My wife's there to make me look good. My kids are there to make me look impressive with their athleticism and their academics. The people at work are there to make me successful. It's me, me, all about me. All the world's a stage. I'm the main actor, and everyone else plays a bit part in my life. That's how I went through life. But here at the Bama Seed, I saw that Jesus looked at people very differently. He looked at their soul. He saw that they were made in the image of God himself. He saw them as worthy of sacrifice and service and compassion and grace and forgiveness and love, servanthood. I also learned that whenever you pour into a person, that is rewarded at the Bema Seat of Christ. It makes sense because people are eternal, and when you're wanting to make an eternal significance, if you pour into an eternal person, <laughs> that's going to make a difference for eternity. I'd heard that before I came here, but the perspective of the Bamer changed everything for me. I didn't have many of those worthwhile type relationships, but one of them, oh, it was my shining moment at the judgment seat of Christ. I was a senior in high school. There was a great guy in our church. He was a lay person. He was a businessman, but he served in the youth ministries. His name was Randall Burton. And Randall took me under his wing as a senior, and he taught me the Word of God. And he taught me about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit lives inside us and convicts us and prompts us and changes us. And I really got in touch with the Spirit and I was, I was moved by His promptings and I did and I obeyed and in the power of His Spirit I was actually making a difference in people's lives. It was the most exciting time in my Christian walk. And about that time there was a young girl in our group, her name was Sandy. And Sandy was having a hard time fitting in. I could tell she just didn't fit in with the rest of the kids. So I went over to her and I introduced myself. And I welcomed her to the group, and I took her and I introduced her to some of the other leaders and some of the other kids, and they put her in my little group that I was, I was working with, and I started to pour into her life. And I looked back at Jesus and said, Jesus, I'd totally forgotten about Sandy. What happened to Sandy? And Jesus allowed me to see what happened the rest of her life. She had prayed to receive Christ with me three weeks after that day. I said, I totally forgot about that. But here at the Bama Seat of Christ, I could see her turning from death to life. I could see the Holy Spirit coming and living inside her. And then she went off to college and she started a great evangelism and discipleship ministry. And I got partial credit for all the people that she led to Christ. <laughs> that was amazing. And then she got married and she had a great marriage and she raised three gorgeous kids and they grew up to know and love Jesus and they had an impact. And I got partial credit for what they did for the kingdom. And she became a Bible teacher and a discipler. And I got partial credit for all the people she discipled and the people they impacted. And I was stunned by the impact a senior high kid could have on another senior high kid and the difference that could make for eternity. And Jesus said, Daniel, put out your hands. I put out my hands. And he put this big, huge, precious stone, this jewel right in my palm. <laughs> 
and the fire came out of his eyes and burned away all the impure motives. And I was left with this pure treasure. And he said, way to go, Daniel, for pouring your life into Sandy. A treasure for all of eternity will be yours. <laughs> oh, investing in people is a worthwhile investment. The problem in my life was that those types of investments were few and far between. The majority of my relationships were of the worthless variety. After high school, I went off to college and got into this frat house and took on the lifestyle that most of those guys led. Started drinking a lot, stayed out late on Saturday nights, dropped going out of church. I just didn't go anymore. I wasn't involved in any Bible study. wasn't growing at all. Started dappling in drugs, became sexually active. I was just a mess. I did one sorority girl after another, used them for a few weeks, and then dumped them, and then Peggy showed up. <laughs> oh, Peggy. She was so different from the other girls. She was so sweet. She was so pure. Uh, she was uh, not sexually active. She wasn't a drinker. She wasn't an abuser of substances. And, and I loved that purity. It really was attractive to me. And we dated for a while, but it didn't take me long to corrupt her at all. And the more time we spent together, the more she became like me. And we started to fight, and we got angry with each other. And eventually we broke up, never to see each other again. I was looking for a rock to crawl under. There weren't any on the throne of Christ. Jesus, whatever happened to Peggy? Oh, he said she was married three times. Her first two husbands abused her. The third one deserted her. I hung my head. He said, what are you thinking? I said, it's my fault. It's my fault that she had such a miserable life. He said, no, Daniel, it's not your fault. Everyone is responsible for their own choices. You are responsible to Peggy. You are not responsible for Peggy. There's a big difference. Yeah, you missed an opportunity to lead her to me, and you led her the other direction. But she's responsible for her own choices. I said, Jesus, what happened? What ended up happening with Peggy? He said, well, actually, somebody shared Christ with Peggy a couple years after her third marriage broke up. She's a believer, and she's here at the Bama, and she wants to talk to you, Daniel. She does? <laughs> Don't worry, Daniel. I promise it will be a, posi a positive encounter. Grace abounds in the heavenlies. <laughs> I looked at the relationships in my life, and I thought, oh, if I could do it again, if I could go back and start over, I would make one huge change in my life. I would quit neglecting my wife and my kids, and I would pour my life into them. I would find other people to pour my life into. I would share the gospel with the lost. I would disciple those who trusted Christ. Because at the Bema, people are everything. Because people matter to Jesus. The third thing I learned at the Bema, the third perspective, the third observation was this, that everything looks different at the Bema. Everything looks different at the Bema. You heard the saying that you can't see the forest for the trees. Well, when I was down on earth, I was walking around with this massive oak tree right in front of my face. <laughs> I thought I could see the big picture, but here from the Bema, where I could really see the big picture, I could see the whole forest at once, I saw how blind I was, how ridiculous many of my choices were. One great example was shortly before Jesus came back, I had a job change. Okay? I got a call from Derek Hogan. <laughs> Derek Hogan was the number one man in my industry in town. And just getting a phone call from him made my heart beat fast. He said, come on over. I want to talk to you. I walked into his beautiful, spacious office. Hello, sir. Nice to meet you. And he said, I'd like you to come work for me. Me? Really? <laughs> oh, man. And he said, not only that, I want to double your salary. <laughs> if I died and gone to heaven, I thought, double my salary? You're kidding me. Double my salary. Okay, I, I need to go talk to my boss. I'll be right back, okay? I, I, he said, it won't be on the table for long. Don't waste your time. I'll be right back, I promise. Now, I had to go talk to John Michelle. John Michelle was a friend of my father. They were college roommates together. He gave me my first chance, my first shot out of college. I made a few mistakes, didn't I, John? <laughs> Every once in a while, <laughs> one or two. Yeah, but you know what? He taught me, and he trained me, and he helped me, and he helped me grow, and he was a wonderful man, a godly guy. I brought some good accounts to the business and uh, became a pretty good salesperson. I said, you know, um, Derek Hogan's invited me to come be part of his firm. I'm going to go over there. They're, 
salary really isn't um, something that you could compete with. But I, I realize that I've brought a lot of big accounts to the firm, and I know you're concerned about that. I promise I won't touch any of them um, for at least three years. Okay, can we shake on that? Okay, thank you. Good, good. Th thank you for all you've done for me. I really appreciated you. And, hey, I'm here! <laughs> I'm all yours! And as soon as I got over to Hogansdale, his demeanor completely changed. He started to tell me what all the requirements would be. He set the quota way up here and said, go reach it. <laughs> and I did because I was pretty good. I worked harder and harder and harder. Worked harder and harder and harder. Started skipping my family, neglecting my wife and kids more and more and more. But I was really making it now. I went up two house sizes in a year and a half. You should have seen the car I was driving. I was sitting at the front row of all the sporting events. It was a great deal. One day I went into Derek Hogan's office. He said, go get that Metro Century account. Oh, I can't get that because that one belongs to Michelle. He said, well, you don't have a no-compete contract with him, do you? I said, well, no, not a contract, but I have an agreement with him. We shook. I gave him my word. He said, your word doesn't mean anything in business, Matthew. He said, go get it. I said, no, I can't. He said, yes, you can. Go get it. I said, no, I can't. He said, go get it or pack your things. Okay. I'll get it. It wasn't hard for me to get it. I still had all the relationships. Couldn't even look him in the eye. I ripped that Metro Century account away from him. Never looked back. Had no idea until here from the perspective of the Bema I could see that it destroyed him as a person and his business collapsed. I thought, boy, a different perspective at the Bema. You see, down there, I thought I was so impressive. I thought I had the world. I thought everything was going my way. I thought I finally made it. But here from the Bema, from the Bema all I saw was neglect of the people that I loved, living my life about temporal things, hurting people who had been so good to me. Everything looked different from the Bema, and I told myself, oh, if I could do it again. I mean, if I could go back and live my life over again, one thing that I would do differently is I would live for this day. I would ask myself, before I do this, what will this look like at the Bema? Before I say this, what will this sound like at the Bema? Before I give this, what will this look like at the Bema? Oh, if I could do it again. I'm ashamed to tell you that the remaining years of my life were completely worthless as far as eternity was concerned. Wood, hay, and stubble just burned away before my eyes because I was so consumed with work. I made no effort at all for eternal things. Jesus came back in my life, and here I was. And Jesus said, okay, we're done. We finished with your judgment. It's time for the summary. I'm ready. Jesus said, Daniel Scott Matthewson. And when he said this, everyone in the whole place could hear. So now everyone was going to hear the summary of my judgment. I said, yes. He said, you were given financial resources beyond most people's wildest dreams. You probably didn't know this. You weren't aware of this. But you were in the top 1% of wealth of all of human history. I had no idea. Yeah, you were. Wow. He said, you squandered the majority of it on yourself. You gave very little for my kingdom purposes. As a result, you sent very little treasure ahead, and you have very little to celebrate at the Bema Seat of Christ regarding your financial stewardship. Yes, Jesus. He said you had the spiritual gift of teaching. You never taught anyone. You had the spiritual gift of encouragement. You rarely encouraged anyone, unless it was self-serving encouragement. Daniel, as I look at your life, I must summarize it as mostly worthless. <laughs> now, what could you possibly hear that could be worse than that? He said, yeah, there were moments where you had an impact for the kingdom, but they were few and far between. The majority of your life was worthless, and I thought, there's nothing worse to hear. And then I heard something worse. <laughs> he said, Daniel, the summary of your judgment is this. You left your first love. My legs gave way. I could barely breathe. I thought, I'll never be able to get back on my feet again. It was true. I mean, it was completely true. I'd trusted him for salvation, and then I'd thrown him away. I'd neglected him. I dragged him around like a pet on a leash. 
When I needed him and I was excited about him and I cuddled with him, but then I just dragged him around. I threw him in the back seat of my oh so impressive life while I drove around. It was completely true. I had left my first love. But then Jesus said the most beautiful, compassionate, graceful words ever spoken to a human being. He said, Daniel, you left your first love, but <laughs> your first love never left you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He said, Daniel, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad. He's not going to condemn me. The old is past. Everything is new. Daniel, it's going to get better from here. <laughs> there were tears rolling down my cheeks, which confused me a little because I had always thought the Bible taught that there's no crying in heaven. And then I remember what those passages in Revelation actually say is that God will wipe away all the tears in heaven, presupposing tears to wipe away. <laughs> well, here are my tears. Tears of regret and disappointment. Shame. Jesus did it for me. He got up off his throne and he walked down to me. He wiped away my tears. <laughs> and I never cried again. Never. He picked me up off my knees and he put his hands on my shoulders. And he said, Daniel Scott Matthewson, be glorified and oh, oh, oh boy. I was glorified and wow. What a difference this was. The moment I was glorified, everything that had been burned in my life completely was removed and erased from my memory. I couldn't remember a thing of the worthlessness of my life. All that was left was my relationship with Christ and my rewards. That was more than enough. <laughs> and I flew back to my seat under my own power. And as I was flying over, I saw my, my wife and kids, and I waved down, and they were jumping up and down, and my kids were doing this. <laughs> That's my dad, they were saying. And I sat down on my seat, and the people all around me were hugging me and patting me on the back and saying, way to go, Daniel. Oh, I thought, this is what heaven's about. Oh, I love it. And I get to stay here forever. The judgments continued and continued and continued and continued. And eventually the last one was complete. As soon as the last judgment was complete, my friend Indira Jensuke, who was sitting here next to me, a man from Japan, stood to his feet, and he had his four crowns on his arms like this, two on each arm. And he flew down to the front of the platform, and he fell on his face before his king, and he threw the crowns at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> and as soon as he did, other people started coming from all over the stadium, and they were throwing their crowns at the feet of Jesus. And I stood up from my seat, and I reached to my head, and I didn't have one. <laughs> I thought, oh, if I could do it again, I mean, if I could go back, I'd get me a crown so that I could go down there now and I could participate in the ultimate act of worship, throwing my crowns at the feet of my king. <laughs> but whether we had crowns or not, we could all offer a song of praise, a sacrifice of praise. And so we did. We started to sing about throwing our crowns at the feet of Jesus and giving ourselves fully to Him. We found our way back to our seats. <clears throat> as soon as we'd all sat down, Jesus got up from His throne at the back of the platform. <laughs> there were so many crowns that He could barely get to the front. There wasn't a crown left on anybody's head. And worked his way through the piles. <laughs> he got all the way to the front. He said, the marriage feast of the Lamb is about to begin. But before we start to feast together, I'm sure you want to catch up with some old family and friends. Go and spend some time. We'll give you another fanfare when it's time for the feast. Go and enjoy yourselves. And we all left at once, billions of glorified beings. If you've ever seen a great fireworks display on the 4th of July, it was nothing compared to this. <laughs> I knew instinctively where to go, and I flew outside of the stadium, and I saw my wife there. <laughs> I hugged her. <laughs> my kids. And we looked at our treasures, and we were amazed at what God was able to do through us. 
And I turned around, and there was John Michelle, my old boss. And he was running towards me with his arms like, like the father of the prodigal son, and he threw his arms around me, and he hugged me, and he said, Oh, Daniel, I love you so much. I love you too. And Sandy came up, the girl I'd led to Christ in high school, and she was radiant and magnificent and beautiful. Perfect. And she grabbed my hand, and she looked into my eyes, and she said, Daniel, Thank you for sharing the gospel with me. Thank you for having an impact in my life. And I said, oh, no, Sandy, thank you for being impacted by me. You were the only one. <laughs> I needed you today. I turned around, and there was Peggy, the girl I'd corrupted in college. And there was no shame. When I looked at her, there was no shame. We started to walk and talk, and we talked about the good times we had together, the enjoyment we had together. And I, off in the distance, thought I heard a noise, and I thought it must be the next fanfare for the feast, but it didn't sound like a fanfare at all. It's kind of annoying and loud, and oh, what is, oh, no, oh, what, oh, and I grabbed my alarm clock, and I pushed off, and it was a dream. No, it couldn't have been a dream. I want to go back. Now, that woke up my wife, who was sleeping next to me. <laughs> she just grumbled and rolled over. And there I was, sitting in my bed, saying, you've got to be kidding me. But then I remembered all those times when I was at the Bama seat, and I'd said to myself, you know what, if I could only go back, if I could do it again, what I would do, I would live my life differently. And I looked at my wife, and I kissed her on the cheek, said, honey, you're not going to recognize hubby when you wake up today. <laughs> and I went into the rooms of all three kids. And I said, Daddy's home. I couldn't wait to pour into my kids. And I ran into my living room, and I got out my Bible, and I looked at 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 14 and the, the Sermon on the Mount and some of Jesus' parables, and I realized that my dream was theologically sound. It was true. One day that was going to happen or something like that. And I felt compelled to get on my knees and pray. A prayer of commitment to my king. A prayer that said, I'm tired of living for this day. I don't want to live for that day. I invite anyone in this room right now, or any other room, to join me in this prayer. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you to say a prayer of commitment, I encourage you, get off your chair right now and get on your knees. Physically, get on your knees with me. Don't feel compelled to do this if the Holy Spirit isn't compelling you, but if He is, I encourage you to obey. And we're going to pray a simple prayer. I'm going to pray it out loud. I'd like you to pray it out loud, too. Pray it really out loud like you mean it. I'll do it phrase by phrase, and it goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I love you. Dear Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Thank you for living inside me. So that I can make an eternal difference. I'm tired of living for myself. I confess that sin before you. I want it to be different from now on. I want my life to never be the same again. Help me to live for that day, not this day. Enable me to pour into people. And help me to focus on what you think, not what others think. I'm all yours, Jesus. I'm not holding anything back. I love you so much. And I can't wait to see you on that day. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name.